I bet you can't count how many times we will cuss in this episode of Bewitch Banter. You have been warned, content is explicit. You are listening to Bewitch Banter, and I have my bestie here today, Krista. Uh, Our stomachs are full. We're very happy. We just Mm -hmm. ate a lot of good food. Courtesy of Amy over here, always cooking me up some bomb-ass healthy meals. 99% of the time, they're healthy. (laughs) Occasionally, we have our Jersey Mike's and McDonald's runs, but that's far and few between. Yeah, definitely. Very far few in between. (laughs) <laughs> we are going to be covering so we covered numerology we got a little debate last week we did and we kind of concluded on the bs meter for me i think i said a nine out of ten would you say eight out of ten okay i think is where i landed and then we're going to do stories today which should be fun yeah and it's been a while since i've been around for story time story time is here <laughs> Light the candle story time. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say, too, like, you're going to cover a piece of shit. I'm going to actually cover some positivity. Um, to get back to our original ideas of even though I'm spiritual, um, people are assholes. And Amy, even though she's a skeptic, thinks people are, for the most part, pretty good. So we're kind of getting back to that. I like it. That vibe. Yes. And I'm going to be covering that bitch Maria Duvall today. That bitch. <laughs> Carol <laughs> Baskins. <laughs> but today it's that bitch Maria Duvall. Which the name sound really familiar. Uh, did you, does it sound familiar Duvall. to you? Duvall. Uh, For a second I was like, did Krista Duvall, already cover this? Duvall. But you haven't. Oh, I'm thinking of Greg Duvall in middle school and we stole his weed. Sorry about it, Greg. <laughs> I'm sure he never li- mind. I'm sure he, he listens. I don't know. He's like that bitch. I'm not gonna listen to her podcast. <laughs> so that bitch, <laughs> Chris, the hands be stealing my weed. <laughs> okay, all right. She's I, get- I have not heard of her. Okay, cool. So she is a renowned psychic from the 70s and 80s. Okay, and this is the big story. So she's. Most famous for being in charge of one of the largest mail frauds of all time. Mail fraud? Like like UPS? Like mail. You sent, yeah. Like oh, a letter USPS, you sent. I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, and then she's also known for using her psychic powers to be able to find missing people. Kind of like the other piece of shit. Sylvia Brown? Sylvia Brown. Downtown Sylvia <laughs> Brown. <laughs> uh, a little bit. I have a background uh, before I dive into, like, what a big bitch she is. She <laughs> was born in Milan, Italy, uh, and she became, she kind of, like, became famous through writing horoscopes for newspapers and doing consultations. Okay. And she was quite the socialite. She hung out with a lot of celebrities, and so I bet she did consultations for, for them, them as well. Yeah, get that money. And she was once on the cover of Vogue, Paris. Ooh, is so, she pretty? Do you have a picture? I do have a picture I can show you later. Okay. Um, I would describe her as having, like, white blonde hair. She was known for wearing, like, silvery eyeshadow at all times. I mean, she's relatively decent looking. She's older, though. She's probably about, when she was really famous, I would say probably in her 70s or 80s. She's Oh, old. damn. So she was an old, old fox. But she looks good for a her good age. Ass- I would give her that. What did we used to joke with the ex about? He, like, loved old ladies. Yeah, he loved cougars. Loved old fucking silver lady cougars. Mm-hmm. He might have liked her. Yeah, I bet you he's, he'd see it and be like, damn. <laughs> I like those women in the nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so she's a psychic. Uh, and now we're going to fast forward to the 90s, okay? So I'm going to set the scene. This is a made-up character, but I just want everyone to understand what she did to people, okay? Okay, okay. So I made this person up. Okay, wow, so good could you get fucking creative. I'm so we got it. Granny Barb. Extra fucking credit today, Miss <laughs> Holt. <laughs> so we got Granny Barb here. Her profile is she loves to knit. She plays bingo with her friends on a Tuesday and has two sons, four grandchildren. But she is super lonely because her husband passed away, okay? Mm. Very heartbroken. Sad. 
So she's having a depressive episode. She's feeling really lonely, mm-hmm. and she goes to the mail, and she finds herself a handwritten letter. And the letter is gonna, is from Marie Duvall. And in the letter, it seems like Maria knows her. And okay. the way she kind of is like, wow, how does she know this about me? She lists Granny Barb's hometown of Meth Vernon and, inclu- <laughs> and includes her age of 70. She's like, no way. In the letter, it mentions Granny Barb's lucky numbers, 666. The devil. <laughs> the devil. As we'll cover. That is my nod to numerology, which... Uh, Obviously, Maria Duvall used to use in her mm-hmm. letters. And these new lucky numbers will bless her with a new lover to keep her less lonely on her nights that she still loves to stay Satan in and knit. Six. So Granny Barb is DTF, but there's a catch. She has to send money to find this new lover. Oh, of course she does. Of course she does. So Granny Barb... Like, it's weird because my mom is Barb, oh, and yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I, didn't think I keep of, thinking about that. I'm like, ew. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't think about all that. All good, all good. Uh, Barb, is, my Barb is a Gigi, as we call her, but uh, also kind of, God bless, walking around on a walker right now because she hurt herself a few weeks ago, and it's like, she kind of looks like a granny, and it's really sad. Aww. But anyway, she's healing well, okay. thankfully. That's a <laughs> fictional Granny Barb. <laughs> so Granny Barb, like 1.4 million other Americans, sends in $40 to learn more about how she can find her new lover. Okay. Thirsty, Grandma. So Granny Barb obviously is made up, but she's not far off story from what's happened to countless other individuals. Wow. So Maria Duvall would send letters to mostly the old, not always. Uh, I'm going to have some examples. It's like, it's like the fucking scams on TV where, uh, you know, like shopping network and shit, they scam old people. Yeah, definitely. Well, but, but via mail in this case. Oh, that's so fucking sad. Yeah, and it, well, you have to think about the time period too because this started in, I believe, like the 90s. Okay. So you don't really have, the internet's not really mm-hmm. up and running much. Not um, quite yet. So she would mostly send letters to the old, but she uh, also have examples of her sending letters to younger people, too. But she got her list, and they called it, quote, the suckers list, and it was provided by a data broker company. And this is where people, mostly old people, but not all... I.e. Amazon and Google today. (laughs) Yeah, but they would disclose information about themselves without really knowing that was going to be kept on record. I don't know how they did that. I didn't really look oh, into that. Oh, they do that shit all the time. It's so illegal. and I don't know if it's illegal because they have all of our information now. But anyway, it's uh, nefarious is my point. So Maria Duvall would send letters to like often the lonely, the old, uh, people who had dementia, oh. cancer <gasps> patients. Stop. So people That's down. That's disgusting. Down on their luck. And uh, she would use. The BS of numerology and, like, tell people they were lucky numbers or tell them they had psychic powers. And That's she, sick. She would tell them, like, to stuff. To use cancer patients and dementia patients? Like, no. Yeah, I mean, it's all totally, like, fucked up on another level. Ugh. And she would tell them, like, she'd give them lucky numbers to, like, win the lottery, avoid, like, being sick. Um, help them with their sickness if they're already sick, um, and then just avoid any terrible things happening to them. Mm-hmm. But in order to keep this conversation going, this is kind of where she hooked her, uh, like, victims. Mm-hmm. Uh, she would say you need to send, each each time they wanted to hear back from her, they needed to send another $40. Mm-hmm. So she would write them, they would respond back, they send her $40, and then she'd write them again, and then it would go on and on. And then when you did respond, uh, they she would then reach out to you and ask for some of your personal belongings. Oh, my so, God. So personal as, like, a lock of your hair. Ew. Fuck no. It's like, that, no. Uh, like, fo- the DNA shit. I don't want to do that bullshit. I don't mm-hmm. think that was a big thing in the 90s, though. No, but, like, just the point of, like, no, sorry about it. Like, even if it could lead to familial DNA and solve a crime, I feel so grossed what, out about it. Are you a murderer? No, I'm saying I could have one in my lineage. We all could, right? But that's yeah. how they solved the, what's it called, case? Garden State Killer? Garden, no. The Golden State. Golden State Killer. No, I'm conflicted. I want to do it because I want to know where I'm from, but also, like, 
what are you doing with my DNA? I don't know. It creeps me out of like sci-fi type shit. But anyway. I don't know. It doesn't really freak me out. Really? Mm Mm-mm. Like what if they make a mutated like baby or something? Well, I wouldn't know about it. But what it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't know about it, so it wouldn't change my life at all. I guess, but okay, I am on tangent. <laughs> Lock of hair. <laughs> These poor people. And why would they make a mutilated baby? Like who wants to take care of it? I guess. I don't know. I'm thinking That's a like, really weird fear. <laughs> it is. I have a lot of irrational fears, as we know. <laughs> yeah, that one's very odd. This was I'm this like, who wants to stuff. take care of this mutilated baby? No, or like X Men and like they create this like Another weird X Men species type of thing. But... Okay, I'm gonna move on with my story. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead because I'm on a way other. Okay, so they're tangent. sending in their photos. They're sending in more money. So of course, the people who are in charge of the scam would immediately take the lock of hair, the photos, throw it in the trash, but then keep the check and cash it in. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. She would, then uh, another way to make money is like, hey, you need this lucky crystal, uh, cosmic charms, trinkets, and lucky charms. So I guess all the charms out there. Okay. Again, this is the longest ongoing mail fraud of all time. They targeted oh over 12 countries. It lasted Holy more shit. than 20 years. And so it's 12 countries, but just in the U.S. and Canada, they raked in more than two hundred million dollars. Holy shit! And just alone in America, she targeted more than sixty times more victims than Bertie Madoff did in the, his Ponzi oh scheme. Oh my god! How That's what, how, I mean, you're gonna get to it, but I want to know how this bitch got caught. Yeah, so it's crazy to me. And like, where was she tried? Like, was it international court? You got ICE involved. Well, it's gonna get interesting. Okay. Oh, it's not that she was just taking their money it got really bad claire ellis not an elderly person but a 17 year old girl oh no uh jumped in a river in sunderland england and she ended up dying of hypothermia and the officials saw it happen but they didn't have like a a rope they weren't able to rescue her okay. in time okay oh, they didn't have like no. a long enough rope to get her oh my god that's really and good. when they rescued her lifeless body they found a letter addressed from maria duvall in her pocket <gasps> there's no hardcore evidence that maria duvall was a part of her suicide but claire's mother thinks she had a really uh played a role in it for sure damn because she said that claire had been getting letters from her for months claire Always had a fascination for the paranormal, but became Mm -hmm. even more obsessed and, like, fixed on it. Mm -hmm. She started to believe she had magical powers. Mm. She was paying Maria Duvall, like, a fortune for a talisman. Talisman. Talisman, sorry. I was like, I didn't know if I was saying that right. And uh, even when Claire passed away, Claire's mother was constantly reminded of Maria Duvall because she kept sending letters after her death. That's fucking disgusting this is sylvia brown bullshit and no it's bad uh, another it's victim of worse well i don't know god okay. i mean they're all pretty terrible right oh my god another victim a mother of five she couldn't pay her bills because she sent all her money to maria duvall oh god and the mother said basically it was like in desperation to be able to give her kids a better life she lost her job and her husband so she was super depressed and um yeah, and then another Utah couple came forward and said their exchange with Maria Duvall's letter letters led them to be homeless. Oh my god! Because they gave her all her, her their money and countless others. So those are just a few ex- examples. The U.S. And, and like the other countries where she is targeting, they all know this is going on. And the U.S. is trying to shut down the operation, but they haven't been a- been successful at all. So we're going to fast forward to around 2014 and the U.S. officials and people investigating it are starting to question, is Marie Duval a real person? So she has been published in newspapers. There's pictures of her, but they start to wonder, is this like a stock photo? Oh my uh, God, that's creepy. They can't track her down. And the big question is like, who the fuck is Maria Duval and does she live? Whoa. And... To answer that some people thought she was a psychic 
Others described her as one of the worst people to ever live. She was descri- <laughs> Sounds like it. She's described as a bottom feeder, feeder, a scam artist. One lady said she's a leech that will suck you dry and take all your money. Oh, my God. Uh, another thing that I thought was interesting is that Maria Duvall, her name is attached to this scam. Uh, but there is another psychic whose names were also in the letter. But for some reason, no one ever really paid any attention to it. Hmm. And his name is Patrick Gurren, if I'm saying that right. Okay. And he is called a power medium. What is that? What the that? fuck's that? I was going to ask you what the fuck that was. I don't even know. And he has a book name. I thought this was hilarious. hilarious. The Amazing Power of the Vibratory Crystals. Sounds like um, a... Vibrator. <laughs> That's what I just <laughs> <laughs> There's That's power that. in that, all right. I was like, uh, what kind of industry was he in? Wait, the power medium? I'm curious. I, hold on. I can look it up while you keep going. Okay. But they can't track Patrick down either. And they can't track down the sources of these letters. In 2014, this is when, uh, through an investigation, they find out the letters that were being sent to Maria Duvall actually were being sent to a businessman in Switzerland. And that's really when they started to be like, okay, does she exist? Well, it's, uh, what's the podcast I, to- I was telling you about? It's a uh, scam queen, Hollywood scam Queen. such a good fucking podcast and they um this 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 scam artist put on a voice of a woman and all sorts of different accents and voices and they found him after doing this incredible investigative journalism and um, the guy got prosecuted but he would pretend to be hollywood elite and fool these actors and and, and people for the first chance to get a gig in hollywood and they'd be stuck in jakarta for like a while it's like dangerous situations and shit but it reminds me of like they couldn't track it down it's very similar to Hmm. this type of scam yeah like it's how sophisticated it could be and then in 2004 the u.s officials came out and confirmed that maria duval does not exist and they believe that she's just being used as a front and like as a way to have like these readers and her these victims have like a personal connection Okay, like, so I found it. Do you want to know? Sorry. Sure. Medium power talker is what Wikipedia is coming up. In telecommunication, the medium power talker is a hypothetical talker with long... Oh, wait. Hold on. This is technical. Hold on. There was something scientific. Or that was scientific. Medium. Okay, right now it's only coming up with technical bullshit. So obviously a power medium's bullshit. Well, we'll cover it another day. The U.S. has now said she doesn't exist, but on the other side of the globe, in Australia, they're coming forward and say, she does exist. Like, we do not agree with that. Also in Australia, they lost about $10 million there to the Maria Duvall scam. Then, we're in 2004, I think. Damn, so she kept it up for quite a while. Oh, yeah, so 20 years. They were able to... Then find out it was being rerouted to a company in Singapore. Mm-hmm. That's so, where this person got caught. So this gets a little confusing. The owner of this company told the Australian officials, uh, they found out who the o- company is. They, The owner of this company told the Australian fish- officials she does exist, and she, live, she lives in either France or Argentina. Oh, my God. And the owner of this company, is, his name is Tony. Hey, Tony. Oh, and then Tony says... Well, if you want to meet her, I will make an arrangement for you to meet her in South America. Like, she does exist. You can meet her. Of course, nothing happens. They never meet her. Another story is in 2000, a lady came forward on an Australian radio station stating she was Maria Duvall. Hmm. But then it ended up being uh, a hoax. her way to get 15 minutes of fame. So she oh. goes on the radio show. She talks about her psychic abilities, and it's basically a big sales pitch. Oh, like, come okay. to me. And then a few years later, a Belgian journalist was able to sit down with a woman who was claiming to be Duval. When they interviewed her, she said, I never write, wrote these letters. But she was very um, defensive. Like, she was defending the operation. She was like, those people who are getting those letters, they're extremely happy. There's only a few who aren't, and those people are entitled to refunds, which we know is all a lie. Well, first of all, they can't if they're dead, so fuck off. Also. They're still, like, 
so confused. Like, who the hell is this person? This is 2014, and this is when the facts and the information kind of start to come to light. In 1985, the name Maria Duval was granted a French trademark, was French trademarked, hmm. or in France it was trademarked, sorry, okay. for commercial use. Several other trademarks were granted around the world, and she was the one who was behind this and asked for these trademarks. When they asked the attorneys who granted these trademarks, right. did, like, did you ever meet her? They were like, no, we never met her. Okay. They discovered that in 2007, she signed a settlement with the U.S. Postal Service that denied she did any wrongdoing. But when they asked the U.S. Postal Service, did you ever meet her? Do you know where the signature comes from? Again, crickets. No one knew anything. Wow. There was the argument, and they kind of knew all along, that it'd be impossible for one person to be in charge of all of this. Yes. Yep. There's no way because all the victims she had, and they're all handwritten. These aren't. Like, who has time to fucking write that many letters? Also, they were saying it was impossible. There's no way one person sure. ever would be able to write them because they're all handwritten. And not just that, they weren't just handwritten letters. But remember, she's making personal connections by connecting personal information about the person she's writing a letter to. Right. So that's going to take even more time because you have to dig in Mm -hmm. and find out information about them. A lot of sleuthing, yeah. Especially without the internet. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's time consuming. You're handwriting letters and you're making, like, connecting the dots and making personal connections not everyone would know. Right. Turns out, basically, a network was behind all of this. And it's crazy how they did this. So um, it was a Hong Kong corporation that was behind all of this Mm -hmm. they would write personalized letters and use psychic names uh the name is the drc 2006 to 2014 is how long the investigation took place so they sent over 56 million letters 56 million so this part is where it gets confusing that's where i was leading us to okay so they were first sent to canada the letters okay then they would take a truck from canada and would take these letters and then deposit them at a u.s postal service in albany and then my parents met oh really (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then at the beaverwick apartments (laughs) beaver and then each batch was about 20 to fifty thousand pieces of mail the letters then were already pre-addressed to three different organizations in different locations, Nevada, Illinois, and Canada. The Postal Service then would send these letters to those corporations. So they've been to Canada, to New York. Now they're being sent to three different companies. The Postal Service... Jesus. Oh, I said that. And then these companies would Still. send the letter out, and they would have their return address on it. That's fucking genius, but also so so oh. sophisticated. Oh, I mean, there's more. And then more. another company would process the payments. Sometimes they were processing about a half a million every two weeks. Jesus. They would then enter the name of the person who sent the money into a database, and then another company would send the tokens uh, and then all the charms and personal follow-up letters. And then another company based in Toronto would send another follow-up letter. Whoa. So that's, like, why it took them so long to figure this all out. Yeah, because they spread it out very strategically. Yeah, like, company after company was involved. So there's... Wow. That's why it was, like, so hard for them ever to really figure out who's behind all this. Holy shit. In 2016's when they kind of officially cracked the case. Okay. Which isn't that long ago. Yeah. So it started in the early 90s. Maria Duvall does exist... But that's not her real name. Her name is Marina, or not, sorry, Marina, Maria Carolina Gamba. And Maria Duvall was kind of like her character name. You know how, like, everyone, like... Like Miss Cleo had. Yeah, exactly. So Maria Gamba sold the rights to her name in the mid-1990s to a group of scammers. Wow. So she was real. She did write horoscopes in the newspapers at one point. And mm-hmm. Maria did profit off the scam, but it was a very, very, very small amount. Mm-hmm. Probably not even worth it, worth it, the amount she got. Wow. Since this whole thing kind of popped off, she's had made, she's made several public appearances. Uh, she's been, like, a news conference in Moscow in 2008. She lives in France. In 2010, she suffered a stroke. And in 2013, she was diagnosed with dementia. So... Now, who was the key players who were actually behind this whole... The whole fucking thing. Operation, yeah, right? operation at this point, yeah. Their names are Maria 
Thanos, and Philip Lett, they both pled guilty to the conspiracy to commit mail fraud. Are they American or are they Canadian? Oh, Canadian. Okay. And they ran uh, one of the companies, Infogest Direct Marketing. So they're... The, like the kind of the owners of this company. Wow. Well, not owner. But I guess they had a boss above them, and his name is Patrice Runner. Okay. In 2019, he was arrested and tracked down in Spain. So it took him a long time for them to find this this guy because they knew this in 2016. So it sure. took three years later. Wow. At this time, he still hasn't made a court appearance. He is still fighting the charges that were made against him. So he has not been found guilty of anything yet. Maria and Philip, though, um, the only article I could find, what if anyone knows of any updates, I, the latest one I could find was 2019. So who knows if it's still in court or if they've been accused. But the article I could find is that they were, at that time in 2019, they could face up to 20 years in prison and $250,000 in fines, which doesn't... That's nothing! That's what I feel like. Because imagine how much they've made right yeah and and the costing people's lives literally in livelihoods like fuck that yeah that's why i feel like two hundred fifty thousand dollars is probably a drop in the bucket right if they made 200 million let alone just in the u.s that's so ridiculous wow and the fact that the other guy is not even uh, charged mm-hmm yeah some bs right mm-hmm try to end it on a good, <laughs> good note if oh there, god if you can <laughs> if there's any but the U.S. was able to recoup about $200,000 from the investigation mm. and send some money back to victims. Also, in 2016, probably when they stormed Infogest and arrested these mm-hmm. motherfuckers, yeah. there were about $800,000 worth of checks that were pending that hadn't been processed yet, and they were able to cancel those out, and those victims were able to get their money back. Wow. But again, like... A lot of the money, they didn't know how to give it back evenly. and Well, because again, 200000 is nothing compared to however many millions and millions you said. Yeah. That's but that it. is that bitch, Maria Duvall, the longest mail fraud that of bitch. all time. <laughs> wow. And she used numerology, of all things, to scam these poor people. That is a case of using numerology for bad. Yes. Not good. Now my BS meter is up to a 10. <laughs> yeah. And that one, I get it. My, mine's rising too. Um, Sweet. I do have a one for you that is not really BS and based in mathematical history. <laughs> Are we going to fall asleep during this one? Um, It's not a math <laughs> class, I promise. <laughs> All right, y'all ready to go back to math class? No. Miss Hens is in the building. <laughs> um, but math. I promise you I am not teaching you motherfucking math because I too fell asleep during math class. However, my story does surround the old ancient mystic and mathematician Pythagoras. And why that's important is because he has an entire branch of numerology founded slash named after him. Are we ready to dive into math class? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to start out my story kind of harkening back to the times before COVID. The time when the four of us were going to take a trip to the Pacific Northwest. Oh, rest in peace, that trip. R.I.P. that trip. <laughs> Amen. Um, Are you... IP <laughs> give and talk. RIP P uh when N-W. the world didn't seem as crazy. It was crazy but not as crazy. Yeah, he wasn't. Um so anyway, we were all gonna go up to what was where were we going? Oregon, in Portland, Seattle, and it's Seattle. gonna be a road trip road trip. Prior to our that trip, I had already been listening to a really fantastic podcast named Tannis. Um Tannis is a bi weekly sci fi uh series. And um, it's by the Public Radio Alliance. I believe it's actually based in Canada. Um, And it's, it's, again, fictional. But I loved it because it took place in the Pacific Northwest and in Vancouver. And so it kind of related to the places we were supposed to go before the world went to shit. And, you know, I could feel, like, immerse myself in the storytelling while we were doing this road trip. 
Um, so the story follows fictional journalist Nick Silver as he attempts to discover the myth of Tannis. What the fuck is Tannis? <laughs> Um, according to the podcast description on Apple, Tannis is the exploration of nature, the nature of truth, conspiracy, and information. Tannis is what happens when the lines of science and fiction blur. And I bring this up because it is relevant, I promise. In Nick Silver's quest to find Tannis, he actually comes upon a lot of ancient myths that are very, um, they end up becoming very like um, angels and demons y. So, like, very Dan Brown, like Illuminati and like crazy conspiracy theories. It's, wait, so what's Tannis? I don't get it. What is it? It's the podcast uh, oh. on its surface. That's what it's called. But in this podcast, it also alludes to an ancient Egyptian city that is debating if it existed or not. Like, okay. some say it was Atlantis and the name was changed. But it's a fictional place that this fictional journalist is trying to seek and understand. But it's also a myth, a mythical city. But it could also be a place, a concept, a person, or a god. And he bring that up because in his research, he is seeking to find what the fuck is it. He, he stumbled upon it through reading. Do you remember good old Alistair Crowley? You mm-hmm. covered him. Briefly. I feel like we should do a whole episode on him. Absolutely. And Jack Parsons. Mm-hmm. So he actually was reading, uh, researching, excuse me, he was researching uh, 50s pulp fiction. And in San Francisco, he stumbled upon this magazine called Strange World Magazine. Oh my God. What? Was a fan on the whole time? Oh fuck it was. Is. The whole entire episode? I'm pretty sure. Or is it just... No, I'm pretty sure. Oh, fuck. Well, oh, rookie mistake. Oh, my God. 105. No, we're too within. We're going for too long. Yeah, today. fuck that. We're not redoing it. I'm getting asked to edit, though. They were. Okay. Well, we learned that. Huh? Molly? We don't learn. We learn. We don't make a lot of dumbass mistakes. Yeah, I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so again, Tannis is the name of this podcast, but also in this podcast, it's a fictional place that may or may not have been Atlantis, where really creepy shit happened. It could be a god, it could be a place, a concept. It's this really weird, ambiguous thing that he goes on this crazy journey to seek. And he gets on this journey because, again, he's researching for a story of 50s Pulp Fiction, and he's in some bookstore in San Francisco and came across a copy of Strange World magazine called Where is Tannis? And it's the fourth story in the magazine, very poorly written by our friend Jack Parsons, who was the sex crazed racketeer. Oh yeah, that was a good episode. (laughs) And he was very involved in the occult, as Amy covered, and um, also unfortunately had some connectivity with L. Ron Hubbard, as we know, whack-ass Scientology and beliefs there. So Parsons was into, not only was he a sex-crazed rocketeer, he, uh, Rocket Man, (laughs) Rocket Man, (laughs) was uh, into researching occult stuff, including what they're dubbing to be Tannis. Now, they say the city was overtaken by the Nile and, you know, went... Uh, what do you call it? It became a ghost town. Like, like it just d- disappeared. Yeah. And it's very, very old. It's been around forever, forever. But according to the podcast, in part of the research, he stumbles upon Pythagoreans. And Pythagoreans had a connection to this place through music and through mathematics. In Nick Silver's research, who again, the fictional journalist, he comes across um, cults and many, many cults. Again, very like Dan Brownie type of like Illuminati type shit. And one of those cults were the Pythagoreans. And yes, they were named for the Greek philosopher Pythagoras. So that's how we enter him and where that whole preamble came in because he was using mathematics to try to solve for these crazy occurring things in nature that often Tannis is associated with. As a recap, again, he is not just a mathematician, but he was a Greek 
Greek philosopher who, if you recall the triangle, the hi- good old hypotenuse, the only class that Amy and I passed in math was, yeah. ge- was geometry. We're very proud of it. <laughs> and we are. I was. I loved like that I could figure things out. And so even though his theorem, the A plus B equals C, I think something like that, again, don't take my math class. <laughs> um, he made huge contributions to not only math, but our understanding of astronomy and music as cool. well. He's got many myths around him. Um, including numerology, but again, his mystic, his like his own mysticism, captivated thousands of Greeks for decades, and eventually, again, these there became innumerable myths that surrounded both his life and his death. Him, a little bit about his biography. <laughs> <laughs> he was born to two very devout Greek parents, and they were devout to the god Apollo, which is the god of what again? Um, I think it's like the main god of greek but like the god i want to say the sun don't quote me on that but i I believe it is the sun god they were very devout um and around he was born around 582 bc near delphi i think he was born with magic always in his creation because his parents, I don't want to fuck up the pronunciations here because they're Greek, so de- deal with it. <laughs> His parents, mens- menscharis, menstruation, <laughs> men- mensacus, and Pathias, um, his mother, visited um, Delphi to visit the Pythian Oracle. And this is one of the highest religious authorities at that time. And she had told them once upon seeing them, that they were going to give birth to a son that changes the world. <laughs> so the parents yep. were told that? Yep. Okay. They, she was told that they needed to move to Phoenicia, which was, I believe, a part of Egypt at that time, for to to develop this young man. <laughs> um, so he probably had a god complex. Yes, I think he might have. And he turns out to be, like, quite godlike to thousands of followers, as we'll get to. He also had a, a series of beliefs on life um, as he grew up. This developed to, quote, 20 years a boy, 20 years a youth, and 20 years a young man. And then finally, 20 years an old man. What about it? So he believed there were four stages of life. Oh, okay. Boy, youth, young man, and old man. I mean, that's not that inaccurate. Yeah, I mean, anyway. But as a boy, uh, he, and it, excuse me, as a boy and young man, he left the Greek Isle of Samos to study philosophy. And this is where he gets into theories and really thinking about the world in a philosophical sense. Philosophical? Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Um, he goes to Miletus, Greece, um, which is on the coast of modern-day Turkey. Here he learned from Thales, which, who was a very famous naturalist, and Ag- Anaximander, Anaximander, um, who developed cosmology or the view of using philosophy to study the world. So very young, he's already introduced to nature, he's introduced to philosophy, very inquisitive mind, and that boyhood stage and young man stage. While still a young man, um, he then dove, dove deeper into mysticism and moved to Memphis in Egypt to study with scholars there. He stayed there for 20 years until he reached the fourth stage of his old man life. <laughs> <laughs> and at six years old, he left Memphis, Egypt for Croton, which there's a Croton Falls, New York. It's on the train. What up? Croton Falls. <laughs> <laughs> for, but Croton is a sub- city in southern Italy. Um, he went from the lesser known scholar to cult leader and rock star status pretty damn quickly and there was a really good washington post article from 1996 actually that that was uh by danny hakim it's called pythagoras the cult of personality and the mystical power of numbers quote <clears throat> pythagoras combined radiance charisma with a shaman's magnetic charm he was a teacher of many things and an uptown mystic in a backwater town, end quote. <laughs> so he was able to use his charisma, like many cult leaders are, to 
wearing a following. Okay. So he captivated div- many, obviously, like I said, with his charm, with these theories, um, many theories, and one of the biggest ones being that numbers held a huge significance in the real world um, and in their role in music. And in fact, he also discovered the role of the sh- length of a string in harmonies. So like if you think of um, guitar, right? Corey's got a shit ton of guitars. In it's music is actually very mathematical. Pythagoras was a big part of that, where the different lengths and tightness of the string is going to produce a different note or frequency. Mm-hmm. Okay. Frequency and yeah, thereby note and sound. Mm-hmm. And so he put that to mathematics and numbers instead okay. of just the sound. So he loved music, obviously, but he obviously loved nature, like loved nature. And this is another quote from that WAPO article. For example, nature or reality at its deepest level is mathematical, he was thought to have said. All is a number, he taught, using a formulation surprisingly close to the views also actually expressed by Albert Einstein, um, that God is a mathematician. This trust in mathematics has been been among the most powerful tools of modern science and especially of physics so using numbers to explain naturally occurring patterns in nature he gained like a huge fucking cult following and the crotonians so remember he moved to this italian town where a lot of greeks lived so he had his peeps there but they not only like idolized him as a teacher but he established uh pythagoras had already established schools so he could teach like these theories in nature and numbers and they began to follow him again like cult-like status they wore white they were all vegetarians they lived in communes they avoided booze they believed in mostly monogamy they did crossfit yeah, she is. <laughs> That's what I need it to be doing. Sounds like a recipe for an obnoxious person. Yeah, I think so. Uh, no, uh, he really, it's really weird. It's like a weird line on him because like I want to respect him so much for, again, because a lot of my beliefs, I think nature is God. And, you know, to me, that's my church, right, is nature. And so I respect him for that. But I think he used his power to just to control people which is essentially a cult (laughs) so yeah granted they were some pretty good people right if they're not engaging in anything nefarious towards other humans however they were very culty and at this time just for historic context greeks were really seeking balance and harmony because a lot of shit was going wrong with the world and the stable years prior of of a smoother democracy and and democratic life um but there was a lot of upheaval politically going on at this time and it really reminded me in my research of like 2016 2016 elections where everybody's just on fucking edge and nobody can get along so people i just think the elections from here on out are gonna be oh yeah we're god awful we're fucked Yay! Um, but, you know, as they say, history repeats itself. Here we are. The Greeks had this the same bullshit going on thousands of years ago, and here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to that end, remember how I covered in, like, New age stuff that people are seeking ways to DIY and, mm-hmm. and connect, reconnect because of all this other bullshit going on in our world. We're trying to make some sense of it. The Greeks were doing the same thing. So not only did they form the Pythagorean cult there was another cult oh many others too but that they were just trying to find a similar or path to not enlightenment but like just something to be stable and 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 x out all this chaos how'd they not drink because i feel like isn't that how they kept water clean back then i don't know maybe they. i thought like most of the time water is so dirty they just drink like beer and wine i think so that but his peeps didn't. Um, I mean, where were they getting their clean water? Because I thought that's like where what people most of the time drank back in the days. Because like you get sick off, yeah. off of other water, like real water, you would get sick. Well, I think no, the Greeks had aqueducts, which were beautifully like clean systems. That's and, true. So 
But I think in the Middle Ages, it got real bad. Well, I know they did that even in Europe. Like, you would just drink because the water was so bad. Yeah. Well, that was after fall of Greece and Rome. Yeah, so I, someone, I was just, I don't know. I'm not, no historian here. Yeah, and I think at this time, again, they had clean water with aqueducts. Don't ask me. Don't at me. This isn't math or history <laughs> class. <laughs> um, even though it's history hour. So, but back to numbers and nature, right? This whole thing's about numerology. Um, his quote followed the belief devoutly that numbers and their study of them related to mysticism, especially that if they followed it particularly, they could lead to spiritual pur- purification and ultimately the uniting of um, individuals in the divine, with the divine. So like you could find God in nature and numbers, essentially through his teachings though it's really tough to know but it it was a religion uh again cult but religion to them and um it's hard because they he didn't have a lot of writings left behind so even the theorem that we we were taught with his name Mm -hmm. may not even come from him himself but more so his brotherhood that followed him and his followers for years after who continued to iterate and like actually make the the mathematical proof of the triangle of the hypotenuse anyway the number one symbolized unity and the origin of all things all other numbers can be created from the number one by adding enough copies of it you get more numbers so (laughs) this example says seven equals one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one (laughs) In real life, he did do, besides this mysticism. So why is that groundbreaking? Isn't that kind of like no shit? I don't really understand why that is, but he. (laughs) I just don't understand why it's groundbreaking. Like someone said, I have one banana and you have one banana and we have two bananas. I wouldn't be like, wow. I don't know. (laughs) It was apparently, but I think it was more of the triangle or. Plus, I think he was the first to prove it. So, like... Prove what that... Like, the mathematical actual proof that things add up. Again, I'm not a math So, they couldn't count before this? I don't know. (laughs) I I look like you're a math teacher. (laughs) I'm just laughing. So, like, you were just like, one plus one plus one. And I'm like, am I supposed to be impressed by this? I don't know. Because I'm not... (laughs) I don't know. Um, I guess I'm confused what the cool part is. He did establish one of the world's first laboratories. <laughs> this is another quote. He learned, that tested acoustics. He found out if you have five bananas and you take one away. Oh my god, there's only four. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't understand. Words over numbers. Thank you. <laughs> Always. <laughs> But he got and discovered that musical pitch is is related to vibration in the string with the various strings length, as I discussed. So that was more so. And that seems like a cooler discovery. Thing. And then also the <laughs> the universe theory about like we're not the center of the universe, but that they're the planets were spherical and also had some. I mean, that's pretty advanced. See, that I'm impressed by that. <laughs> You're not impressed impressed by one plus one equals two. <laughs> no. <laughs> No. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I was waiting for the punchline. I was like, okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> People, by the way, um, believe in reincarnation. And they did not eat beans because they. Oh, this is like the Mediterranean lifestyle to yeah. eat beans. You're supposed to have like a cup of beans a day and it's supposed to help you live for so many more years. They did not eat them because they believed that they were used or sorry they used them in performing sacrifices what Um, yep and they entered temples barefoot what kind of sacrifices are you making with beans human (laughs) you're gonna make people fart to death (laughs) (laughs) no i'm just like what kind of sacrifice would you do with a bean um (laughs) i don't know but There's anyhow, lots of questions to be. <laughs> he was revered, nonetheless. But going back to some you of give the, people a fart attack. <laughs> some of the myths behind him, because they were so impressed by your being unimpressed <laughs> in mathematical discoveries, that um, they thought he was God himself. They equated him to having <laughs> this a this bitch can count. He's God. They equated him to having. Um, 
being the god like the god apollo and the one story is said that he had a golden leg i don't know what that why but they said he was like that i'm still stuck on the beans (laughs) (laughs) oh my god too because they were vegetarian i feel Mm -hmm. like beans would be like a big staple in your diet yeah yeah Sucks. Sucks. <laughs> they say. Um, but one of the biggest myths is surrounding his death, which I thought was pretty cool. What happened to him? Because he died in a very similar way as Jack Parsons, supposedly. Did he blow up? He was blown up by... Uh, Beans. His ass farts. Because he farted too much. Beans, no, he Beans, was not. Beans. No. The more you eat, the more, the more you, you fart. fart. Um... <laughs> No, so remember how I was saying it was a really uh, uneasy time for Greeks in society. Like, yeah. shit was shaky. There was a group of people next in the town over from where he was at this time in, um, where was it? Cro- Croatia, not Croatia, sorry, Croton again. And they were known as really savage warriors. But Pythagoras was like, fuck that, we're going to fight back. And they did. Almost won. However, they fought back on their own right and came back and they actually blew up the place where he was said to have been staying. Some myths say that he escaped. Okay. Some myths say he died there. And then others say that he lived forever with this brotherhood. So... Which one do you believe? Uh, you know, that he lived forever um, through numer- numerology. <laughs> um, but essentially, again, in his, his numerology, he's assigning each letter of the alphabet a number. And through that, you, there's certain ways to live your life. And there's like, quote unquote, divine numbers. So if your name adds up to like a 23 or something, you would be divine. Okay. So Is that anyway. why you were chasing a 23-year-old lately? Oh, shit. You got to put me on blast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Side note is... Um, 23-year-olds aren't experienced in the bedroom. Yeah, don't That's go. why I try to tell her. Ladies. She thought she was going to live her best cougar I moment. I really did. I was so fucking excited. Mm-mm-mm. I didn't got time to fucking teach uh, Young Bucks how to do the job. So I teach for a living... Okay, I don't need to teach you how to downstairs work, work me. Um, any <laughs> way, um, Pythagoras also was an educator and scholar, as I've mentioned. He was super revered, though. Again, I think because of his discoveries and the discoveries that his people and followers took after him. In fact, Plato was like one of his um, what do you call it, proteges, and really developed obviously as we know many theories and philosophies that we still use in the western thinking today so while we don't necessarily believe in numerology obviously as a principle to guide our lives or our cities or our our mathematical and scientific teachings he brought to the mathematical world a huge way of thinking in in solving problems and doing that all through nature and to me, I think that's pretty badass, whether or not, you know, yes, he may have been a cult leader, <laughs> but I also... That little tidbit? I also think that, you know, he was able to help us bring, change the world in a way where we we're still taught about the hypotenuse, like in the triangle. I can't explain it because I'm, again, words, not math. It's still the way in which he proved the theory was the groundbreaking thing. And Amy and I joked earlier because, again, we don't clearly understand, like, anything past (laughs) one plus one plus one plus one plus one. (laughs) Hey, that's some groundbreaking shit there. Um, (laughs) But, no, it brought into the world a a new way of thinking and solving problems all just by looking at patterns in nature. And I think that's pretty fucking cool. Mm -hmm. So... Again, numerology BS meter is pretty high, but I just thought it was a really cool, like a good person in history that brought advances to where we are now today and still use many of those theories in math and music. So good job. The end. (laughs)
of us talking about math probably for the rest of this podcast ever again history. <laughs> i don't think it'll happen again but we might be wrong i really yeah sorry about that guys i certainly not the mathematician that uh these ancient greeks were so anyway that's that's what i get cool on a positive person i had a pretty terrible person you got a shitty fucking person well i wonder People. how complicit she was in all of it she didn't seem that involved but she yeah, did. but I mean, how bad do you think that bitch feels that she stole her name and her rights? But she they... was getting profit, so she was, like, she could have ratted them out, you know what I mean? Yeah, she was still benefiting. Exactly. Fuck that. Anyway, what's it? we got some cool topics coming your way next week. Not sure what they are, but they and... will be cool. <laughs> I'll be and, up front. <laughs> and some collabos with our friends from the Strange Brew podcast. Uh, date TBD, but we're really looking forward to maybe getting stoned with those fellas. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. I'm excited. Yeah. So uh, with that, um, we're tired. It's a Thursday night, and uh, we're slap happy. So peace, be witches. Thanks for listening. Check us out on Instagram or bewitchbanter.com. Suggestions for the show? Emails at bewitchbanter at gmail.com. Credits? Music Phantom Fun by Jonathan Boyle from premiumbeat.com. Podcast edited and produced by Krista Hins and Amy Holt. As always, if you enjoyed, please rate, review, and subscribe.